All right, let's uh, get started. Um, so today's uh, topic is sort of the <clears throat> one of the uh, la last papers we're going to talk about distributed systems. Um, uh, there's a sort of a somewhat related paper on Thursday. We'll we'll talk about sort of empirical bugs in verified systems. Um, but today we're going to talk about network verification. And the problem here is trying to figure out how can we formally specify, reason about, verify um, something like the computer networks we're all using uh, between our machines. Um, so the reason this is a sort of an interesting problem is sort of uh, both because of the importance of this uh, network. So the, uh, the, the network that we're gonna consider is a important building block for any serious computer system today, for any distributed system or going on the internet, um, super important. Um, and at the same time, it's got sort of um, interestingly, you know, appealing fairly narrow specs. So uh, in contrast to some of the other things we've looked at in this class, like file systems or, you know, a distributed system like Ironfleet, the spec for network is sort of deceptively um, simple or maybe narrow spec. The, just focuses on packets going through the network. So you have a packet coming in and it needs to end up somewhere else. Um, so the spec is kind of narrow. So that makes it a very appealing target for precisely specifying and verifying what's going on. Um, but at the same time, th there's actually uh, some subtleties as we'll talk about, um, uh, as with any real system. Um, there's a lot of interesting issues having to do with the fact that the network is actually composed of multiple machines. So there's a lot of concurrency, distributed system aspects going on. Um, in-flight packets that are sitting in the middle of a network. Um, and trying to deal with that turns out to be a little bit tricky. Uh, at the same time, so okay, so it's like an important problem, seems like a good narrow spec, uh, but the implementations are complicated. So that's another reason why you might want to verify and gain confidence that this complicated system is implemented correctly. Um, so there's lots of complications. For example, there's network protocols involved that uh, have different switches and routers talking to each other. Um, it's a distributed system. So all those problems that we've talked about uh, come into play. So you might have switches that fail independently of other switches and you have to reconfigure dealing with faults and so on. So it's a, you know, tricky problem, uh, but, but an important one. And um, we'll use this lecture uh, to look at, uh, at, at the space and see, see what's possible. Um, and the particular angle on network verification that we're gonna take in this lecture is looking at it through the lens of so software defined networks or SDNs. And this is what the paper you guys read for today uh, talks about. So SDN is a particular fairly recent, reasonably popular set of ideas about how to operate a network. And in some ways, it is a pretty serious simplification. So instead of having a distributed network of switches all running their sort of independent protocols and uh, uh, configurations, um, there's a central controller in, um, in a software defined network, there's a central computer called the controller whose job is to make all the decisions for the network, even though the network is composed of many switches. And we'll look at this in detail. And the cool thing is that um, it really sort of reduces complexity. And not only is the reducing complexity in terms of having fewer computers running sort of complicated pieces of software perhaps, but also it means that your entire network is now gonna be controlled and configured from one place. Whereas before, as we'll talk about in a bit, the behavior of the network really emerges from all the different routers being configured in different ways. So now, because this thing is all configured in one place, you can actually formally reason about it because it's exactly precise in one place, what, how the network is gonna operate. Um, so this is why this seems like a good uh, target for verification. And that's what this paper um, for uh, is actually looking at. Um, so this paper that we assigned for you guys to read uh, for today um, is really this uh, sort of interesting, very programming language-ish paper, if you will. Uh, so it has that flavor. Um, but really what these guys are trying to propose in the paper is a framework in COC. Um, so some kind of framework for 
reasoning about software defined network you know, implementations, verification or formal reasoning. And there's sort of both things are happening in the paper, right? Like they have the framework and then they build a SDN using this framework. And one thing that you might sort of have seen in the paper is that the paper is much more about the framework and not as much about the particular SDN controller that they happen to have verified. Um, but nonetheless, this paper gives us a good excuse to talk about what is SDN, what is this framework, what does it look like, et cetera, even if the particular SDN controller that's being verified is a little bit on the toy side there. Um, and sort of the cool thing going on is that it really, it's a nice model for how an SDN operates, uh, which is an interesting thing to know about, and uh, a fairly simple, as we were talking about, uh, controller that they happen to verify doesn't actually exercise sort of all the fancy features that their network framework might support, but at least it's something. That makes sense? Any questions so far? All right, so let's uh, jump in. And uh, one thing I wanna start with is perhaps giving you a little bit of a contrast to appreciate what is SDN. Um, maybe this lecture is gonna be a bit more on the background side than on the specific paper <laughs> material. Um, but I wanted to give you some appreciation for what is an SDN and what is sort of cool about it. And we'll start by sort of setting up a contrast with how networks um, traditionally, if you will, um, operate. And so a network, what I mean is you have a bunch of switches. Um, so here's a couple of switches. Uh, these things are devices with lots of ethernet ports to a first approximation, and they're connected in some way to each other, maybe multiple links. Uh, and I should say the historical terminology has been to call switches one thing, and then there's routers, depending on what kinds of packets and how they make decisions about how to redirect and switch packets. I think the modern terminology, almost everything is a switch these days, um, certainly for this paper. Um, they worry about switches looking both at ethernet packets and IP packets and TCP packets. Um, but uh, so th there's a sort of this fabric of switches and then what you imagine is there's sort of end user computers maybe connected to various ports on these switches represented by these circles over here. And in this network, you might have a bunch of different goals, right? So, so you might have um, goals or maybe specs they're not gonna be super formal yet, uh, but probably the thing you care about in a network first order is reachability. So can you actually get somewhere? Can, can you have this computer reach this other computer through the network? Um, sort of somewhat related to reachability. Reachability is a positive property and you might almost think it's a liveness property, uh, but maybe uh, what this paper focuses on more is almost the negative reachability, which is access control or permissions security. So being able to um, filter packets and make sure that certain machines cannot talk to other services or computers. Um, another typical goal for a network is some kind of fault tolerance. So this ends up being probably the big driver for almost quite a bit of the complexity in networks is that you really wanna deal with all kinds of things going wrong. So you might have link failures. So some cable gets cut. You might have a switch failure. Some switch gets unplugged or has a hardware failure, et cetera. And you want the network to keep working because we actually have some redundancy uh, in this topology that I drew, for example. Um, there's other sort of properties you might worry about. There's resources that are get assigned to different users of the network like bandwidth. Uh, there's middle boxes, which is a, kind of a more recent story that this paper talks about. You might have some nodes in the network whose job is to look at packets and keep forwarding them along or to filter them in some way or to log them. So the paper makes a big deal about being able to, for example, set policies that log packets by sending them a copy of them to some switch port. Um, so there's a lot of things you might care about from the network side. And, um, but the, 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 we'll talk about this, it's like not a, maybe not as complicated as some of the specs we've seen for distributed systems or for other uh, things that we've uh, seen earlier in this class. Um, and the way that these networks are typically built in a traditional um, style, if you will. So the traditional implementation um, really relies on um, some kind of a per switch 
behavior or configuration. So every switch in this picture is independently configured uh, by an operator, maybe using some tool, but each switch gets a configuration that encodes various policies and uh, settings of how it should operate. And then there's a protocol between switches that actually um, helps the switches coordinate. So this might be a routing protocol that helps the switches distribute a routing table and understand how everything is gonna, how all the packets are gonna get forwarded. Um, so what you see is that each switch really has a couple of things going on. There's some sort of a config uh, and maybe policy that's sitting in the switch. This is set by the operator that controls the filtering, access control, etc. And then there's some dynamic state sitting in a switch like a routing table that usually gets computed using some kind of a uh, routing protocol that the switches talk to each other. And what you actually see in the end is that there's, you know, you can think of it as like there's agreement between the switches on the protocol that they're gonna talk about, uh, but not necessarily upfront any agreement on the configuration. So the switches might be configured in different ways and it's only the protocol that really uh, decides how they're gonna interoperate with one another with their respective um, config settings. And this is sort of part of the reason why the networks tend to be kind of complicated to reason about is that the behavior of the network really stems from each switch being configured in its own way and then talking some protocol that establishes a routing table and then the policy is really set on each local switch instead of being global property. Um, so some of the complications that you see in a classical or traditional style network where each switch is independent. And you see actually such systems today, especially on larger scales, like the whole internet looks closer to this picture than the SDN world. Um, but uh, it certainly has some, some problems like we've talked about the stemming from the complexity of each switch or router here being independent. Does that make sense? Sort of a little bit of a background on what networks look like. Uh, in a simplistic view, at least. All right, so no questions. So let's talk a bit then about uh, SDNs or software defined networks and what that looks like. Um, so a slightly different view of the world. So at the bottom, we're still gonna have our switches. So the actual wires and boxes we have in our racks are probably still gonna be the same in an SDN world. So you still have these switches with the end nodes hanging off of them. But then what actually is gonna happen is that we're gonna actually have a new box called a controller. And this guy, there's gonna be one of them, right? So that we have many switches. The reason is probably we have lots of ports and a big building to connect with all the computers there. Um, but we're gonna have one controller computer whose job is gonna be to tell the switches what to do. Um, so the way Maybe the sort of initial way to think of it is that uh, behind the scenes, there's gonna be some kind of a link between every switch and the controller indicated by this special color here. And these guys are gonna somehow connect to the controller behind the scenes um, and have the controller orchestrate the entire operation of the network. And these special colored lines here, they're not actually physical wires that you necessarily have to run to the switches. What's actually going on uh, in terms of physical topology is that the controller is just another computer probably plugged into one of these switches or maybe a couple of switches. And uh, uh, these red or whatever magenta lines are actually sort of static routes over the network topology. So maybe to make this a little bit more concrete, here's maybe the physical port the controller is gonna plug into the switch with this orange wire. And then every other switch is going to figure out how to get to the controller. That's gonna be like pretty much the only configuration that the switch has to know. So previously the switch has to be configured with a policy, with the routing tables, all this stuff. In this SDN world, the only switch, the only thing a switch needs to know is how it gets to the uh, controller. So here the plan is this switch will use this link and then get to the controller this way. This switch maybe goes this way and over here. This switch goes here. And these orange lines sort of indicate how this overlay of uh, sort of switches connected to the controller is actually realized. 
All right, but back to sort of what this controller is good for. Um, so this controller, you can logically think of as being a single global switch. So a correct, but maybe low performance way of view an SDN is that every switch, when it receives a packet from an end host, like this guy on the left, the packet, the, the machine sends a, a packet to the switch. The switch just sends the packet directly to the controller and says, hey, here's a packet. I don't know what to do with it. You figure it out. And the controller looks at the packet and decides, ah, it's got to go to this guy on the right. So it then sends it to this switch and says, ah, please send out this packet out of your interface. And it's going to arrive on this computer on the right. So that's a low performance way of thinking of this SDN. And as a result, what's going on is this controller really has uh, some sort of a really global view of the network. And it actually knows where every computer is plugged in because every switch tells it what's going on. It knows which links are working or not working and so on. And as a result, uh, it can actually implement a fairly centralized fault tolerance plan and decide how to route around link failures. It can also implement a centralized access control plan. Uh, it just looks at all the ports, looks at where packets are supposed or not supposed to go. You can almost think of writing a simple Python program running on this controller that decides, and no need for a complicated protocol that runs across switches. It is just a single centralized program. So that's a really cool thing. And uh, you can sort of solve all the problems if you have a centralized controller. Um, in terms of being able to do it with less complexity than our distributed implementations before. And this is sort of a logical view of the SDN. The only thing missing so far is I haven't said how to get performance. And the story for performance is that uh, each individual node in this SDN, each individual switch, uh, is going to maintain a little cache of some sort, uh, what the paper I think calls a flow cache or a flow table. And the way to think of this flow cache or flow table is that the controller, when it sees packets going from one computer to another, if there's lots of packets going the same way and all of them are getting forwarded to the controller, what the controller can do is to actually send a message to the switch to say, ah, please install in your routing table a entry that says packets from here should go out this way and then insert an entry in this routing table that says these incoming packets should go to this link and so on. Insert a message here. So these packets end up going to this computer on the right. Uh, sorry for the slightly messy diagram. Uh, but uh, what's going on in this picture is that the controller in an SDN worldview uh, is able to configure, tell the switches what to do at a very low level it doesn't actually have to set a policy or any config entries or a protocol. It has a very direct statement about packets that match this pattern are going to go to this output port. And in this paper, they sort of present a simplified view, at least, of what one of these SDN switches does, which is to take messages that just really match on certain bits in the header. And the result of this match is going to be a set of things to do with the packet, like decrement the TTL field or something and which ports to send the packet out on. Um, it's a fairly restrictive set of operations compared to a very complicated switch we saw in this previous view where each switch was like a computer running some protocol, et cetera. Does this make sense? So it's SDN sort of view of the world. Um, and there's sort of you know, good and bad things about it. So um, you know, why SDNs? Um, you might want to know. Um, so on the positive side, I think it's actually quite a bit simpler. So centralized uh, means simpler, uh, both uh, in terms of software and system complexity, uh, sort of both the complexity goes down, as well as the control or configuration uh, is simpler. Um, you might think of them as being related, but if I am an operator and I got a large complicated network, might be much easier for me to set a single rule in a central controller rather than figure out how to configure all of my switches to do something that I might care about. Um, there's a lot of to be said for the centralized property. And uh, I think this is why actually SDN ideas are pretty widely uh, used. Uh, OpenFlow itself, uh, I'm not sure how necessarily it's taken off. Uh, I think there are some complications there. Um, 
but uh, the ideas of having a centralized controller operating network are pretty widely spread these days in large networking systems, enterprises, uh, large internet you know, providers you might see, et cetera. Um, another big benefit of SDN um, is um, sort of simple switches, if you will, which uh, means easier deployment. So if you have a switch that fails, then there wasn't that much going on on the switch. You can plug in a different switch and the controller will just set up those flow cache entries on the new switch, just like it was setting them up on the old switch. So much easier to replace switches because there's much less state on them and potentially they might be homogeneous. I think one of the purported benefits of OpenFlow was really uh, proposing it as a common API for all switches to implement. So you might have switches from various vendors like Cisco or Juniper or HP or who knows what else. And a single network controller can talk to all these switches in the same way, it doesn't actually have to care which vendor it is. Um, so this is sort of a one big reason why I think OpenFlow uh, was pretty appealing in some ways, but at the same time, maybe the vendors are not super excited about being interchangeable. Uh, so there's some, some problems sort of behind the scenes with OpenFlow, I think. Um, but I think nonetheless, a serious plus for having a standardized network platform. One of the downsides, I should say, of uh, using this SDN plan for a network is really that um, controller now has to be very reliable and high performance. So previously, if one switch fails, then, well, that part of the network is dead, but everything else keeps working. Now, if the controller fails, your whole network stops. That's pretty unfortunate. And even if you have a computer plugged into multiple switches, well, if the controller dies, all the switches die. Um, so it seems like a bad property. And it really puts a lot of pressure on making sure your controller is in good shape and reliable and so on. Um, you can think of it maybe as a good thing because it really focuses what you have to make reliable and performant. Whereas before it was sort of vaguely spread out across switches. Um, but uh, nonetheless, I think this is a potentially a serious consideration for an SDN is that you really are putting all your eggs in one basket of this controller. And the last sort of argument for why SDN isn't so maybe great, one of the downsides is that it really works well for a single organization uh, because there is a single controller. So all these benefits uh, that come from having a single place where the configuration is set um, really mean that there's one entity setting the configuration. So this works pretty well if you have a company with a large network or maybe a company like Google that runs sort of made in data centers and you can even do SDN-like ideas on wide area links between data centers, that all works pretty well. But if you have many companies, they might not actually agree on what the policy is and they don't want uh, each other's operators monkeying with a global configuration. So this is why at the internet scale, you don't see sort of SDN-like ideas quite as widely uh, spread and the internet scale uh, network still looks like this classical picture you saw on the previous slide with independent routers talking to each other through protocols and the routers are independently configured. Um, so these SDN ideas are pretty good in some certain category of networks, like medium-sized networks. If they're too small, then like at home or in a small company, probably not worth the overhead of running an SDN. Like medium-sized single enterprises or even large enterprises, that's where SDN really shines. And then if you have a super complicated organization with lots of entities that don't really get along with each other, maybe SDN is gonna be a complicated cell or at the internet scale. Hopefully it gives some sense of what this SDN thing is. Uh, any questions about SDNs, networks, et cetera? What they're good for? All right. So the next thing I wanna talk about a little bit is um, sort of this goal that we uh, started out talking about, which is how do we do any kind of formal verification or reasoning um, for networks? So there's a couple of fairly specialized aspects of network verification that um, pr probably mean you can, you can use slightly different approaches here. Um, so a couple of unique aspects that 
uh, are worth <laughs> trying to understand. Um, so one interesting thing in networks is that there's relatively no state abstraction going on. So what I mean by this is that in, um, you know, almost. Uh, what I mean by this is that um, in a typical system like we've seen in the, this class, like Armada or FSCQ or CompCert, all of them typically change the level at which they talk about the computer system. So uh, by example, some of the file system papers like FSCQ or SybilFS, you look at a disk at the lowest level and then the spec at the higher level is a tree of files and directories. Uh, or in Iron Fleet, at the bottom level, you have computers executing instructions and you have memory in the Daphne programming language. And then once you get up to the whole system, well, it's a replicated state machine which transitions atomically from one step to another. So there's big leaps in terms of the state abstraction that we've seen in many of these verified systems or specified systems. In contrast, for a network, pretty much it's always packets. So there's very little going on in terms of trying to build bigger abstractions in terms of packets. Uh, now of course, there are some low level details like signaling and how packets are exactly encoded, but that very quickly disappears at the very sort of bottom layers. And pretty much all the action in verifying a network is really all about talking about the same packets and describing what happens to them at a low level where the switches really look at each packet individually, and then talking about what happens to the same exact packets at a higher level, like the packet went from this computer, went through the network and ended up at this output port. Um, so that's one interesting thing going on in network verification, which is that we don't actually change the network abstraction very much. It's all the same packets composed of bits or bytes, realistically. Um, so that's kind of an interesting thing. Um, Another thing that's going on is that in some ways there's not a whole lot of different properties that you might care about or a few classes of properties. Uh, so as we talked about, there's you know, reachability, maybe there's filtering kinds of properties which are kind of the same thing, a question of can a packet go from here to there or will a packet go from here to there? Uh, and uh, so reachability and filtering are kind of one class. Maybe there's resource policies like how many resources will uh, one computer get versus another computer, or one flow versus different flow, and maybe something about middle boxes. Uh, but again, these are all sort of properties about you know, network paths, where packets travel. So relatively constrained language in terms of how you can talk about your goals or what the spec is for a network system. And the final sort of interesting thing going on in network verification is that the state space is kind of small. And what I mean by this is that um, there's not a whole lot of state that the network remembers. So there's just the packets that it's operating on, but by and large, you can think of the network as being kind of stateless, uh, at least over medium term. So the network might remember some flow information about ongoing TCP connections right now. Uh, but by and large, the question of whether a network is gonna allow a certain TCP connection is independent of what other connections are going on or what connections went before or after. So there's very little state in the network itself. And even the, um, so I guess we should say, you know, the network is kind of stateless uh, and the packets uh, are really controlled by their headers. So it's usually not the case that these networks look at the whole packet, but really they look at some small header like the IP destination or port number. Uh, maybe you can look at both the source and the destination. Uh, there's a fairly restricted and small set of bits of state that you care about in a given network packet. So this is, it looks like a fairly constrained problem. Um, and as a result, um, what I wanna mention is that uh, this paper has a fairly uh, opinionated view of how to verify SDNs that's fairly language oriented and um, compiler heavy. We'll talk about that in a second, but an important alternative plan to sort of think about um, that we're not gonna really discuss in much detail in this class, but seems like a good idea is really to push on model checking. Um, 
in some ways. So model checking, if you remember, we saw it in various papers, like in the I4 or IV paper, we talked a bit about model checking, we saw it uh, show up in a couple of other uh, pieces of work, Amazon's paper, etc. Um, model checking works pretty well when you are just sort of enumerating lots of possible combinations and trying out lots of states. And especially when your state space is bounded, model checking can work pretty well. And in general, model checking seems to be actually a pretty good fit for these unique aspects of network verification, right? So because there's no state abstraction, um, there's you know no existential quantifiers. Maybe a bit of a reach in terms of <laughs> uh, making it so uh, <laughs> uh, black and white. Um, I'm sure there's some, some details to be worked out, but roughly speaking, one complication with model checking is that if you have sort of complicated state abstractions, the model checker might have a hard time coming up with the abstract state that corresponds to how your system is executing. But here, there's no state abstraction. It's all packets. It's just checking a bunch of properties on packets. And there's relatively few properties, and the state space is small. So it might be um, that exploring state space is uh, viable, that uh, you can sort of encode a bunch of rules for how to brute force packets, maybe using some symbolic execution or Z3, etc. cetera. Uh, seems like a good fit. And indeed, there's a bunch of papers that you guys didn't read for this lecture that really push on this way of looking at network verification in terms of trying to leverage the fact that it's a fairly constrained problem, both in terms of predicates and states. Um, there's some papers on header space analysis, on some exhaustive verification of router or switch implementations, et cetera, that uh, take this route. Uh, but this paper is sort of a different uh, approach, also interesting to look at, uh, and potentially maybe can do some things that are difficult to do with exhaustive model checking. All right, so does this make sense, uh, sort of the broad space network verification, before we jump into what this particular paper is doing and how they're thinking about it? All right, so no questions about that. Let's uh, look at what this paper is going for. Um, so as I said, this paper has a fairly PL view of what a network is and what network verification looks like, uh, you know, coming from the authors, uh, not to mean it necessarily in any good or bad way, uh, just, uh, you know, they, they sort of formalize the same stuff in a slightly different fashion. Um, they really model everything as a program even when perhaps in our presentation of this, we would have sort of described it as you know, messages being sent or state machine transitions. Same thing at the end of the day, but uh, uh, hopefully you guys were able to understand the paper despite that. Um, so the way they view the network or sort of this SDN worldview for them is that they think of a configuration. So they, they of course, okay, they're in this SDN worldview. They think there's a controller that's running the whole network. And for them, they have a slightly narrower interpretation of what a controller is compared to perhaps what I described so far and what I think network operators think of as an SDN controller. So for them, an SDN controller is really just executing some specific global configuration. So there's some kind of a configuration written as a program and this program is in a funny programming language called Netcore. And this program, uh, this Netcore program, describes how the network should work as a whole. So this program covers all the switches that comprise an SDN network. And this is kind of a funny looking programming language, right? It doesn't have, you know, if statements and function calls like you might be used to in Python. Um, there's basically four constructs going on in this language. It's all about packets, reflecting the fact that we're in this network verification world where it's always packets, there's no abstractions. Um, so there's sort of three primitives for really writing packet rules. Um, so you can run a, write a predicate which uh, describes which packets should I match. Um, and you could look at a specific set of headers. You're not allowed to look at arbitrary offsets in a packet as far as I understand it in this language. Uh, and then once you match a packet, there's two things you can do in the language with a packet. Um, so you can actually transform it 
Uh, this paper doesn't actually say much about what these transforms look like, but from my understanding, there's a fairly limited set of transforms that you're allowed to do to a packet, which correspond to things that the hardware, the switch hardware has basically hardware support for. You can't really afford for performance reasons to give each packet in a switch to a CPU to process. So these transforms are simple things like maybe change the destination IP address or decrement the TTL field in an IP packet, um, fairly uh, standard restricted for things. And um, the other thing you can do to a packet is uh, some kind of an action. And these actions are really uh, deciding what the output ports are. And uh, what that means is that uh, you match a packet uh, with a predicate, then you decide how you want to transform the packet a little bit, decrement the TTL and whatnot, and where you want to send this in terms of actions. And on top of these three primitives that deal with individual packets or sort of classes of packets, um, there's combinators. So instead of semicolons and function calls like you would have in a programming language, their combinators are really these two things, union and restrict. So these are the two operators you can use to combine little snippets of netcore code into bigger snippets of netcore code. So the way to think of union is you might have one predicate that forwards certain packets to one output port and you got another predicate with a different action going to a different output port. Well, you wanna do both, you put a union operator on them. So you say for these there, union, for these guys there. And this union, you can, the, the reason they think of it as a union is that uh, it's sort of the union of all these rules or transformations on packets. Uh, and then the restrict operator is kind of the opposite of union where you might want to say, uh, apply this set of predicates and actions, but only with respect to a certain subset of packets. Um, and they sort of argue that, well, maybe for certain mathematically inclined network operators, this is a very convenient language for writing down what the network policy should be. Um, I think in reality, SDNs don't maybe look like this very algebraic form, but for this paper, they posit that's the uh, <laughs> way that the SDN should look like. So that's sort of the centerpiece, I think, for their uh, plan for in formalizing SDNs. Um, now there's stuff sort of above and below this netcore program. The stuff above, they don't really talk about much in the paper, but there's probably some kind of an operator or some sort of a policy that is driving these netcore programs. Um, so you might actually reconfigure the program if you decide you need to change the network. So again, remember, I, I think their paper is a little bit narrow in terms of what an SDN configuration or program is. So in particular, their netcore program says the literal port where the packet should go at all times. So if you have a computer that used to be plugged into one port and now you unplug it and you plug it into a different port in your switch, well, all of a sudden the netcore program has to change to forward your packets elsewhere. Uh, so in their worldview, this means that something higher up above what the paper talks about is going to decide that here's a new program and uh, compile it and run it again. Or if one of the links in the network fails, well, again, something higher up like the operator or some policy or some other monitoring system has got to notice this and reconfigure by supplying or writing a new netcore program. So uh, kind of, a, you know, I, I, I think they're a little bit you know, narrowly scoping what an SDN controller is, but nonetheless, that's what they mean by an SDN controller is that it's gonna be a program which defines the configuration of your network at an instant in time. And they don't really talk much about evolution in this paper at least. So that's the specification, if you will. That's what the program is supposed, that's what the SDN controller should be doing. And then they logically think of it as uh, uh, being transformed into what they call as a global flow table. And this for them is an intermediate representation effectively, where um, it's kind of a similar set of things uh, to their netcore program. They still have these uh, you know, predicates and transforms and actions. Uh, so all that stuff shows up in the flow table, but the big delta here, like the difference from the netcore language is that instead of having union and restrict operators, uh, they really have priorities. 
as the combination mechanism. So net core is very algebraic and there's union structures everywhere. The flow table is just like a giant table. Each row in the table probably looks a lot like one of these predicates and transforms and actions, but then all the table rows are ordered by priority and there's no union operator anymore. It's just the first, first match in the flow table is the answer for what happens to your packet. So that's what they uh, sort of think of as being the next level of abstraction. And then below that, they actually have these uh, switches sitting. Um, so you might have actually multiple switches below this flow table abstraction. And um, you sort of have the switches talk to the network controller and get entries from the flow table. Um, and uh, that's uh, sort of their view of the world. And these switches now are actually Sort of the execution model for them. This is how the world actually runs in their formalization. And uh, they have a particular formalization of what goes on in this protocol. Uh, they call this featherweight open flow, um, which is their fairly simplified view of what the protocol is between uh, a network controller or a SDN controller and a switch at the bottom level. Um, so there's some messages that the switch can send. So in their model, the switch can basically send a packet or an unmatched packet up to the controller, uh, to the flow table and the centralized machinery. Uh, if there's some packet that it got that doesn't know what to do with. And in the other direction, the controller can program a switch by sending it you know, messages to add or delete, you know, flow entries from its table. And this is the execution model for them. That's what it means for a controller to run. And in their view, then the controller, I've been sort of implicitly talking about it here. Um, for them, I think it's really a combination of a compiler plus a runtime. Um, so, in some ways, very similar to CompSearch, if you remember that paper about verifying a C compiler from the early in this class. Uh, so CompSearch was very much of the flavor of trying to write a compiler that preserved the semantics and it took in as input a C program and produced an assembly program as output. And the goal for CompSearch was to make sure the assembly program had the same semantics as a C program. Their view of the world is that the controller is actually kind of like a CompSert compiler. So what they do is they actually have the netcore program uh, goes in and the compiler transforms them into a controller executable. Um, and then you run this controller executable and it interacts uh, with the switches because um, you have to actually program these flow table entries into the switches and so on. And the result of running a controller uh, executable is going to be sort of a, you know, the desired network, if you will, configuration. So that's the story for them that the correctness theorem sort of mostly comes in in this uh, piece in the compiler. So the compiler, as a theorem that says it'll the, the resulting executable will have the same behavior as the original netcore program. And then this executable, uh, the, the sense in which it has the same behavior is that when you run the executable, it talks to the switches and gets them to make the network operate a certain way. And there's a logical view in which you can look at the netcore program and say, well, that netcore program has also a certain semantics, meaning what, what should the network, what does the netcore program want, want it to happen in the network? and those behaviors are gonna be the same. That's what the compiler theorem is telling us. Does that make sense? Questions about what these guys are doing here. So in many ways, uh, fairly, or at least at a high level, a similar story to CompCert, uh, sort of probably the big delta over CompCert um, is really, well, a fairly specialized DSL programming language for like, talking about networks as opposed to general purpose C code. But also there's quite a bit of asynchrony um, in the API for the switches. So as we'll see, 
Um, there's a lot of subtleties and uh, out of order events that can happen uh, when you're running this controller executable and the switch can reorder your entries and so on. So reasoning about that uh, turns out to be tricky. Uh, another thing that really is a big deal in real SDNs that they don't really model is that the program changes over time. Because in a real SDN, you will change this configuration, but the network has to keep running. You can sort of say, well, kill the network controller, we'll stop the network, flush everything. Now let's compile a new controller, let's run it. And a minute later, the network is back and running. You gotta be able to reconfigure this thing on the fly. Uh, that's a serious thing that CompSer doesn't deal with. And uh, their framework maybe could deal with it, but certainly their toy example and the sort of reasoning principles they present in this paper aren't really tackling this reconfiguration problem. Uh, in CompSert, of course, if you compile a new program, you got to kill the old one, restart the new guy. And there's no real theorem about what, what's the relation between the old program and the new program. But in an SDN, the network is still there and you expect some continuity and some uh, consistent policies when you reconfigure the controller. So that's another sort of interesting challenge that you might have wanted to see here, but this paper doesn't address it. There, there's a link actually in the lecture notes on a, another paper by the same authors that tries to look at, at this question a little bit more, uh, but not in quite the same cock level formalization. All right, so does this make sense? Any questions so far? All right, so I thought I'd give you guys a little bit of time to sort of discuss the reading question we assigned for you guys. Um, the reading question, uh, hopefully it made some sense. Uh, the goal for us was to really try to get you guys to think about where does this um, verified open flow controller sit in the grand scheme of things? Like you wanna actually prove some theorem about how your network operates. To what extent does this open flow verified controller help you and what extra theorems do you have to state on top of it? What assumptions are still there, etc. cetera. Awesome. And uh, the question was hoping to give you guys a concrete example. Like suppose I have a network that I run and I got three services that I'm running on different computers and I wanna configure it so that each service logs its packets to an audit server and I got three servers on my machine and three audit servers, one for each real server. And the audit server is supposed to, I don't know, audit my HTTP requests and all this stuff. So the question is, I wanna prove a theorem saying all the traffic on my network is being logged. To what extent does this uh, sort of open flow controller helping us? How would you use it? What, what would you reason about, et cetera? Um, that makes sense as a reading question. I guess you guys already answered it. So uh, to some extent. Um, but any questions before we try to do a breakout group on this and see what you guys thought? All right, so let me put you guys into breakout groups and I'll see you back in uh, 10 minutes or so. Perhaps. All right, so I think we got everyone back. Um, see if that's actually true. I think so. I think everyone's back here. Um, so what did you guys think? Uh, any thoughts on how you might use this open flow controller to help you prove what your network is doing? I'll pick on someone, uh, maybe Eileen. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think this is, you know, definitely an interesting paper, a lot of stuff in it. Um, I was a bit confused about it and we talked about it and I think there's still some stuff I need to clarify. But, um, I guess we kind of talked about how we would write out the rules in the program to say, um, based on some information in the header of the packet, you would send it to its actual destination and also um, an audit server and, um, I think one question that we had was um, like, how do you um, deal with kind of the different places the packets can be? Like, can you just say like, oh, um, we'll just look at all the packets that are received by a server and go off of that for our theorems. 
um, or what if like the attack gets dropped. Um, yeah, I honestly, I think there's still stuff I need to. Uh, yep. No, 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 actually, yeah, so sorry. Like, I, I should say actually, like this paper stumped me quite a bit when we were presenting it last year in this class and I had to talk to the authors to make some sense of this paper even. Uh, so I think both the PL aspects of it are a little bit on like, confusing or hard, hard to make sense of in some ways for me as a non-PL uh, reader. And I think also the paper doesn't pin down everything. Uh, but I think you're talking about many of the right issues to sort of uh, try to figure out here. Um, I should say, I don't think I have any deep answer for like what the answer to this question is, uh, but hopefully it's a good forcing function as you saw to like really tease apart what, how would you use this. Um, so I think one interesting question is like, I think there's quite a bit going on above the NetCore program in terms of end-to-end packet behavior. So as you guys, it sounds like we're talking about, you need to, like the network program itself even talks about the packet traversing many switches in the middle. And uh, we, it, at the network program level, it's important which switch sees the packet. Um, but for end-to-end -end properties, like all packets need to go to some audit server, it's like actually a little bit, a bunch of extraneous information that NetCore would have to talk about. Uh, so you'd probably need to define your own notion above NetCore um, that maybe just talks about the external sort of wrapper around the network. In some sense, like NetCore doesn't really have a sense of some ports being external and like jacks in the wall where you'd actually plug in a computer or a server versus some ports being internal connections between switches. But I think in the way in which many users would want to use an SDN system, they probably do make a big distinction between here's a mesh of switches connected in the middle and here's a bunch of external ports facing the users and servers and other computers plugged in here. Uh, so that would probably be a thing you'd need to define on top of NetCore in order to make your life easier to write down specs like this whole server auditing business. Um, yeah. And then probably, yeah, you'd need to configure the NetCore program to actually forward your packet along. This is another sort of funny thing that the paper doesn't really talk about very much. Uh, namely, how do you generate these NetCore programs? Because there's a lot of information encoded in the NetCore program, like which hops should a packet take? It's like a packet comes in, it's supposed to go to the server, but at the NetCore level, you gotta actually say it goes to this hop, then this hop, then this hop. And that's a fairly detailed description that you know, has to come from somewhere. Probably not the network operator manually choosing the path for every packet though. Uh, so there's quite a bit, I think, uh, happening above NetCore um, that you'd need to realize to use it. Any other thoughts or anything else from your questions that I missed? I wasn't actually convinced that this paper is set up to do this at all in the sense that in two senses, I think, as you said, it's not about verifying NetCore programs. It's just about implementing them correctly. Um, and then in a second sense, which is that this feels like a liveness property, which is very hard to state in terms of safety. Yeah, so there's two things going on. Yeah, so one thing is you're saying, yeah, it's, it's like CompCert where the correctness property is like for all programs, you'll get the same behavior. And then almost the same thing that the CompCert paper leaves out, these guys also leave out. So in CompCert, I would have wanted some proof that like, look, this program has no undefined behavior and will run correctly. But CompCert leaves that sort of up to the application developer. In the same way this paper says, well, here's a great tool. It's a NetCore compiler, but it's up to you to figure out if your NetCore program is what you want. And I think this is what the, sort of this question, if you will, is really getting at. Like, how do you know that you're logging everything correctly? Uh, well, we got to set up our own semantics. Well, sorry, they do provide semantics for NetCore programs, but we got to set up our own proof plan for how to look at a NetCore program and say, oh, well, yeah, that's a NetCore program I like because for every packet that will come into an ex external port, it'll go to one of the audit servers by case analysis or something like this. I guess so, the other property, yeah, sorry, go ahead. When we were doing CompCert, um, there was a little bit of confusion about this issue about undefined, undefined behavior. And I finally, after it was too late, came to the conclusion that we weren't thinking about it in the right way because the only situation which you're gonna care about having your program compiled by a certified compiler 
is when you've already done a proof of the program. Otherwise, there's no point in having the compiler certified because it's certainly not the weakest link in the chain if you don't have a proof. And presumably the proof is gonna guarantee that you don't have undefined behavior in your program. Yeah. So otherwise that's... you couldn't get the proof to go through. And I wonder whether anything similar to that is true here. I imagine the sensible way to use this would indeed involve a proof, uh, or if you wanted to get the benefits of this. Um, I don't believe these guys are proving anything about any particular Netcore programs from what I saw or from talking to them. So they don't have any notion that there are some nice properties of the network that you could state. I think they do or like this broader group of research this broader group of researchers has done lots of other work in this related spaces uh, including stating properties of SDN configurations but not in the same framework as this netcore mm. controller paper mm -hmm. very much like you mentioned like any use of compsert probably should prove something interesting about the C program well they probably would but using a different semantics and well hopefully your semantics uh differ in boring details that are not related to your bugs. <laughs> Surely they will differ, uh, but the question is, are they material in a sense or not? Yeah. All right. So I guess the other thing that Tej said is a liveness property uh, that uh, this actually audit requirement that I was asking about is almost a property of uh, there will be the packet sent to an audit server uh, which is indeed, in some sense, a liveness property because, uh, you know, for all I care, if you give me a trace showing that lots of packets were sent to the HTTP server, but none were sent to the audit server, I can't really say it's wrong because maybe the next thing that's going to happen is like there's a gigantic buffer of audit packets built up somewhere <laughs> in the network ready to be sent. Uh, so in principle, you're right that indeed uh, this is a liveness property, which indeed these guys are not entirely set up to to do. All right. Any other sort of questions related to this homework puzzle? I think one thing that I didn't totally understand is how exactly the uh, verified runtime system uh, gets its input from the output of the Netcore compiler, which as I understand, just outputs a flow table um, or flow tables, I guess. And, and I don't quite understand how the two of them get put together and like how I would actually deploy deploy it, you know, a network using Netcore and and all that. Yeah. So my understanding is that they produce, so maybe let me try to draw out what this picture looks like. Um, so I think they have their sort of Netcore compiler that takes the flow table. Uh, so here, here the Netcore program comes in. Uh, so this compiler, by the way, okay, so like, there's some .v file in Coq that implements the compiler. They do the OCaml extraction, I think, to produce an OCaml version of this compiler. They have the Netcore program going in. The compiler generates this global flow table. And then there is this flow table goes into a runtime, which is also uh, part of this OCaml extraction, maybe from a different .v file. And then this runtime takes a flow table and then interacts with the switches behind the scenes. And actually realizes this global flow table across this set of backend switches. So I think that's the what actually is going on. So like here's all the stuff written in cock, these .v files, and then uh, you produce these two OCaml libraries. I think they get linked into actually the same program, uh, and the end-to-end -end theorem holds about the combination of these .v files, if you will, and then ideally, if your OCaml extraction is great has no bugs, then you have confidence that this Netcore program semantics are preserved in how the switches get configured through the open flow protocol that the runtime speaks to them. I see. And there's sort of this one complication that we haven't sort of talked about yet, but like this interaction between switches and the runtime um, 
uh, there's really, well, I guess I already mentioned that the switch can actually forward a packet to the runtime if the switch doesn't know what to do with the packet. And then in the reverse direction, there are sort of basically four commands that are interesting that the runtime can tell to the switch. They can do an add flow to add a new flow table entry, a delete flow. You can issue a barrier, uh, which sort of synchronizes a bunch of these commands and you can you know, inject a packet which basically is uh, if, if you didn't have a flow table entry and the packet went up to the controller through this packet message, then the controller can re-inject this packet in an arbitrary switch uh, and tell it, please send the switch on port number three. Uh, and the barrier command, that's sort of the most interesting thing they are trying to deal with here. Uh, so the, there's a stream of commands going from the controller to the switch. And you might have an add flow message another add flow message, a delete flow message, and so on. And in this queue of messages that the controller is sending to the switch, um, the switch in the open flow protocol has the freedom to actually reorder these commands in any way it wants. Kind of like the disk that we saw in FSCQ where the disk has the freedom to reorder disk writes. Uh, so for mostly the same reasons, uh, there's a barrier command that the open flow controller can issue to the switch to say, please process all this stuff first. Then when you're done, process the stuff after the barrier. And this allows you to synchronize, allows the controller to synchronize what's going on in the switch. And this is sort of all for performance reasons. Now this is like one of the places where the paper is really, the framework that they set up is much more complicated and featureful than the actual implementation. So the framework has a model of the switches actually being able to do all this barrier stuff and asynchrony. Their implementation is kind of depressingly simple. It just inserts a barrier as every other command. <laughs> so it's just like peppers barriers everywhere. And they just like have a rule that says every odd command must be a barrier. <laughs> and that's it. Uh, and then it sort of magically turns it into a synchronous thing, but maybe not very high performance. So this is sort of you know what I meant by this paper is much more about the framework than the actual controller that they cook up. Uh, I think they could do a much fancier controller and prove fancier theorems about it maybe. That makes sense a little bit about how the extraction works. Any other questions? Um, I had one question that was kind of um, I guess unrelated to like the the actual like flow generation sure. and stuff. Um, is the, has the OCaml extraction from cock ever actually been verified? Because I feel like if that hasn't been verified, that could be like- a Yeah, it has not been verified. Thing. It is a source of a bunch of bugs in practice. Like we, uh, we use the Haskell extraction for our research for quite a while. And you know, it was fairly routine for us to cause crashes in Haskell or to have memory corruption in Haskell because the extraction does something not quite right. Um, you know, it's getting better over time. I think there's some work on trying to verify extraction, but nothing actually finished. Uh, maybe Tej has more that he knows. Yeah, I just saw uh, that Zoe finished her thesis on Certicoc, so it's a good reminder that Certicoc exists. Um, so Certicoc is a project to write, ver to, to verify essentially compilation of Coq. Um, it's not quite as powerful as extraction in that you can also use extraction the way they do where you extract part of a program and then you link it with the parts that do the IO operations. Um, sort of Coq doesn't give you a theorem about the composition of these two things. Um, it's not quite that fancy, um, but at least you have a verified compiler for like functional programs written in Coq. I should say that's much less, it's it's much less complex than the extraction pipeline, right? Like you get to use the very good compilers of OCaml and Haskell when you do that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Cool. Um, all right, so maybe the last thing I wanna talk about is there's an interesting uh, tidbit in this paper where um, they actually talk about a thing called the by simulation. Um, so what's going on is that, uh, so by simulation is the way they define correctness for their execution of NetCore programs. And just to remind you, the way we've typically talked about correctness in this class so far is that we have some kind of a spec like NetCore at the top and these uh, specs produce possible execution traces. And if you remember from this paper, their execution trace is basically a history of all the ports 
that the packet has arrived on. So all the input packet events. Um, so that's what an execution trace of Netcore is. And then the implementation um, also produces a set of execution traces. So here, are, these are the featherweight open flow switches. So when you have all these switches put together, uh, combined to, into a system, all controlled by the same controller, that also produces a set of execution traces. And these traces are the actual input events on the real open flow switches. So the standard correctness property that we've uh, sort of proposed in this class for the most part is a trace inclusion property that basically says that the spec traces are a subset, I'm sorry, um, no, the implementation traces are a subset of the spec traces. So the arrow is going up. So that means that everything that the implementation can do is allowed by the spec. That's the usual trace inclusion property. The slightly weird thing going on in this paper is they actually go the other way as well. So this is what they mean by, by simulation. They also require that the spec traces themselves also be a subset of the implementation traces. So this is this by simulation property that they talk about in the sort of later in the paper, which actually boils down to trace equality. What this means is that not only is every implementation trace allowed by the spec, but the other is also true. Everything the spec allows has to happen in the implementation. It's kind of a crazy property to uh, try to argue for. Um, so one reason, um, or wh why might you want this? <laughs> so um, after sort of discussing this a little bit with the authors of the paper, I think the answer is that they actually sort of wanted to ensure progress of some sort. Um, so what I mean by this is that um, the regular trace inclusion property allows an open flow controller that drops all the packets. Because indeed, a perfectly fine configuration is you drop all the packets at the implementation level, and the spec level, you justify this by saying, oh yeah, I took all the packets in and they're just in my infinite buffer. They're just sitting there, not getting sent, but they might get sent eventually. <laughs> so this is sort of a boring justification for a very sort of trivially correct uh, open flow controller. And similarly, uh, maybe more annoyingly, you might have bugs where you accidentally drop too many packets in your controller implementation. And it's possible to justify dropping any packets you want at the spec level by saying, oh yeah, I just buffered them. That's how my implementation is uh, correct. So this by simulation relation for them requires that anything that the spec says could happen, like a packet could get sent out now, is also gonna happen at the implementation level. So that rules out these uh, sort of degenerate controller implementations that drop packets. Um, so that's sort of, I think, one cool thing. Um, why not, of course, uh, is that it's a, it's a very sort of strange restriction. Um, so basically any non-determinism that the spec allows, like buffering for an arbitrary amount of time, now has to be realized in the switch as well, which is kind of crazy. The hardware has to support arbitrary buffering. So that's not really gonna happen. So I think the way they intended this to be used is that maybe you have Netcore and then you have the featherweight open flow model. And here you have by simulation both ways. And then you have featherweight open flow hardware. And here you have only one way inclusion. The model has lots of non-determinism in it that allows the by simulation to sort of work out in both directions, both, both this and the other way. But the hardware, of course, doesn't have as much non-determinism as the model. So this by, there's only one way simulation from the hardware up to the model. So that's maybe one interesting tidbit in this paper that hopefully this makes some sense about. Uh, all right, so we're out of time. Uh, so uh, we'll talk about uh, actually looking for bugs in uh, verified distributed systems on Thursday. And then we'll next week switch to talking about security verification uh, as the next and last topic in this class. So uh, see you guys on Thursday. Happy to hang around afterwards if you have questions uh, separately. <laughs>